I, uh, I love this, this series. Proverbs, is it still been good for you guys? You're still learning, you're still growing. Hopefully you're getting stuff out of this, pro, this study on the book of Proverbs. We've got a couple more weeks. Um, how, many, how many, does anybody know how long it is till Christmas? 56 days. Wow. <laughs> they, they know. Uh, 50, 56 days. Well, that sounds a lot less threatening when you, when you break it down into weeks. But uh, we only got a couple weeks left of life groups. We do life groups right up until the week before Thanksgiving. So we just got a couple more weeks. And today we're in Proverbs chapter 11. And we're going to be actually taking a proverb and kind of diving into it a little bit. Normally, I'll take and unpack an entire chapter or entire section of scripture. But as you get into Proverbs, especially the latter part of Proverbs, they get a little... Uh, they get a little spotty, like you'll hit one thing in one verse and then another thing in another verse. And so today will be a little topical, but I wanted to give you some other great Proverbs from chapter 11. There's some good ones in here. Uh, it says this in Proverbs chapter 11, verse two, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. I love that on, on just character and humility. Solomon talks, does a great job of kind of just uncovering that. Uh, this is a good one coming up. How many of you know what's going to happen Tuesday? <laughs> How many of you don't care anymore? How many of you care deeply? Yeah. Okay. No problems either way. I care deeply because I'm praying about what the, what the country's going to look like that my children are growing up in. I'm praying about all those things. So I'm not saying there's anything bad about it, but I do want you to hear this proverb. Okay? I also want to clarify that your neighbor isn't only the person who lives next door to you. Say amen. amen. Your neighbor could be somebody on social media so lean into this one. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. Proverbs eleven twelve. This is a great one on generosity. One gives freely and yet they grow all the richer while another one withholds what he should give and they only suffer want. It's a great passage on generosity, on, on God's economy. That, that system of how it is better, you're more blessed to give than to receive. And then I just threw this one in here because this is awesome. Anytime you get to use a verse that has the phrase pig snout in it, it's going to be a good one, all right? Like a gold ring in a pig snout is a woman without discretion. And I don't know where you're going to ever use that, but if you want to write it down, you can. Um, uh, and ladies, there's some ones about men in there too. Um, but uh, uh, that's some from Proverbs chapter 11. The one I want to dive into today is chapter 11, verse 14. And Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14 says this, where there is no guidance, a people fall. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. In an abundance of counselors, there is safety. This is a phrase that, uh, that I tell people all the time. I say this to everybody. And sometimes I get weird looks from it. Sometimes I get heads shaking at me. And here's the phrase I say. Everyone, everyone needs counseling. Everyone needs it. You say, ah, oh, Pastor Vince, I'm fine. Which is a telltale sign that you probably need counseling. Okay. Um, and, and I think sometimes we get counsel, good counsel, godly counsel, and therapy mixed up because they're not always the same. I'm not saying everybody needs therapy. Some people have walked through some horribly traumatic events in their life, and they, they need to dive into that, and they need to unpack that in a healthy way. But, but I do believe that everybody needs counsel. I think every, we, we were not built to do this life by ourselves. How many of you have ever made a decision and then regretted it? Today. How many of you that today? <laughs> I think we all have these moments where we've made decisions in our life or we've, or we've walked through a season of our life and we didn't, we didn't trust in anybody. We didn't lean into anybody and we had it. I've got it. That's one of my favorites. You hear that from the time kids, if you try, and once your toddler starts to get old enough, they're like, I got it. I got it. You try to pick them up and they're wiggling, trying to get out of your hand. I got it. Try to tie their shoe when they've just been learning and they don't know what they're doing. And they walk away with the shoelace hanging off behind them. Why? Because they got it. 
And how many of you know, we as parents, we tend to teach them a lesson by just letting them fall flat on their face. Say amen if that's you. It's me. I'm like, fine. I don't care if you trip over your shoelace, punk kid. I mean, I wouldn't say that to you. That's why I'm not our children's pastor. <laughs> I got to preach in there two weeks ago. We had a blast, okay? And I didn't call any of your kids punks. So I may have called mine a punk, but I didn't call your kid a punk. But I want you to see that this, we take information from someplace. Who or what speaks into you? Some of you got some people in your life that you trust their, their words, you trust what they say, you trust their advice, and that's great if you got that. Some of you don't know that you trust people, but you trust that thumb as you scroll through stuff and see stuff, and, and, and we'll, we'll trust that counsel in our life. You say, well, that's not really counsel, that's just news. Eh. We trust it, or we wouldn't, we wouldn't keep watching it, or we wouldn't keep ingesting it. So there's a part of us that, that either feel, maybe it's not trust, maybe it's just satisfaction. We feel satisfied by it. And, and, and that's a dangerous place to be. And so today I figure what I wanted to do out of this passage where, where Solomon writes this to his son, and he says, hey, listen, I want you, I want you to get this. What do you want me to get, Dad? I want you to get that where there's no guidance, you're going to fall. You're going to fall. But if you have an abundance of counselors, if you have, you have several good sources pouring into you, then there's safety and there's health. Good sources pouring into you. And so I'm, I'm going to give you four sources today, okay? Four good sources that you can allow to pour into you, that you can trust, okay? Three of them, you're going to be like, yeah, that's so churchy, Pastor Vince, and that's okay. One of them you're going to wrestle with and you're going to probably fight against it, but that's all right too. So as we dive into this, the first thing, the first place where you can receive good godly counsel is this, God's word. The, the, the Bible, the word of God. You say, Pastor Vince, I hate reading the Bible. Listen, I love the Bible. Okay, I've said, I say that often. I used to teach a class called What is the Bible? And that's how I started it off. I love the Bible. I, I, I have fallen in love with the Bible over and over and over again, but let me just be very clear with you. I did not fall in love with the Bible doing a read the Bible through in a year Bible plan. Because the same thing happens to about 95% of the people is you get into Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, and you're like, oh, I hate this book. I mean, I love this book. Lord, I love you. But did we have to spend this much time on how many bullocks I have to sacrifice or if a turtle dove will work or what if it's a goat and not a sheep? I don't think I can do this, God. I don't think I can. And, and it's a struggle to get through. So what we do is we read out of guilt to the point where it gets hard and then we quit. That's not what I want you to do. I want you to fall in love with the Bible. You say, how do I do that? Well, you fall in love with the source of the Bible. And the way you fall in love with the source of the Bible is you get to know him. And the way you get to know him is you read through the gospels. So people say, well, read John. I, read any of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. In fact, I would tell you to read them all. Read all four of them first before you go to any place else in the Bible. You say, why would I do that? Well, because here's the thing. When you're in a dating relationship, how many of you remember dating? How many of you are still dating? Any singles in the house? Let's see we got... I was going to have you stand up and just look across the room. That'd be awkward, right? <laughs> I got a row four and a row five. Let's, no, I won't do that. I won't do that. <laughs> but when you're dating and you're trying to get in a relationship, I can remember when Jennifer and I started dating, there were questions that I wanted to ask. And I was loving hanging out with her in the present, but I wanted to get to know kind of who she was. And how I got to know who she was was started asking questions about where she had come from. Where are you from? I'm from Yellville. Really? Like you were born there? I was born in Yellville. Is anybody ever born in Yellville? She was. <laughs> She's like, the nursing home used to be the hospital, and I was born at. I was like, you were born in a nursing home? She's, <laughs> she was like, no, it used to be a hospital. And I got to know this about her. I got to know about her family. I got to know about her mom. I got to know about her dad. I got to know about her grandparents. She loves dearly. And I got to know all this stuff. But I got to know her in the present, and I got to learn about her going both ways, what had been behind her and our future going forward. 
It's the same way you should be attacking the word of God. You get to know Jesus, and the more you get to know Jesus, the more curious you're going to be about what was behind him and how he could walk in your future going forward. But if you don't figure out how to fall in love with Jesus in his word, then you won't ever use the word of God as good counsel in your life. You won't ever use it as a source that pours into you. And I can tell you, matter of factly, with zero hesitation, that had it not been for the Bible, had it not been for the word of God in moments of my life, in seasons in my life, I would not have made it. And I don't want that to sound like me being dramatic. I'm telling you, there were moments of darkness and depression where I sat there and I said, God, I don't know that anybody knows what I'm feeling. And I'd flip over to the book of Psalms and I'd see David hiding in a cave going, oh God, that someone would care for my soul so that I would not be alone in this desperation. And I go, oh, wait a minute. That guy knows exactly what I'm feeling. That guy knows. So I'm not alone in this. And the moments I'll pray and I don't get an answer. And I'm like, God, I don't know what to do. And he said, you don't have to know what to do. And I'm like, that's not how my brain works. Any of y'all ever have that argument with God? I'm like, that's not how it works. He said, here's what you do know, Vince. From the word of God, you know that I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know that I will supply all of your needs. You know that my strength is made perfect when you finally admit that you have weakness. And then if I didn't know the Bible, I wouldn't know those promises and I would still be trying to figure out how to do it on my own. And I'm just gonna tell you, I don't do good on my own. I am not built that way. I know some of you are built that way. Some of you are like, I got it. I get it. And I'm so thankful that you stubborn people exist. You're like, I'm not stubborn. I'm just stubborn. That's the word, okay? They're stiff-necked is what the Bible says, if you'd rather me call you that. But I have seasons of that too. But I'm learning as I get older that I'm going to learn, I, I've got to release some things and I've got to learn to trust that God's word is true. And it's not just true for me speaking it to other people. It's true in my life. And it's true for my day to day. And it's true for the walk that I have. And it's true when I'm in the valley. And it's true when I'm on the mountain. It's true when I'm struggling. And it's true when I am killing it in life, or at least I feel like I am. How many of you know it never fails at the moment you feel like you're killing it? It's about how long it takes for that to change. And if I didn't have the word of God in my life, the Bible says this, he talks about this passage in Psalms and, and I'm just gonna give you one scripture from each of these points. And, and one of them is this, Psalm says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my, well, Pastor Vince, isn't lamp and light the same thing? It's very similar. Lamp says, hey, I'm gonna give you some direction. Light is a source of life. We don't live without it. He says, it's not just, I'm not just trying to give you direction. I'm trying to give you life. And life is found in my words. Read them, learn them, fall in love with it. Say, Pastor Vince, I don't even like to read. Here's what you do. You put Darth Vader reading the Bible in your car. I mean, I know he has a real name. It's James Earl Jones. And he reads the Bible through. And it's incredible. But you can literally sit there and listen. to. Get in the car, turn it on. 10 minutes to work, 20, 10 minutes home from work. You've got the Bible for 20 minutes in your day. I hope your windows are up. <laughs> Some of you are going to be reading about the flood on the way home. <laughs> See what I did? I just instilled doubt. Now some of you are like, oh, no. Did you roll them up? I don't know if I rolled them up. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. And so as, as we learn to love the Bible and we learn to love the word of God and we learn to pour into it and reach for it in times of struggle, the moments that I have learned to reach for my Bible in times of struggle. Now, here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to fall in love with the word of God by doing the flip and point method. You all know what the flipping point method is? People do this all the time and it drives me nuts. They're like, I'm just trying to find God's will for my life. And they'll flip through their Bible and be like, this. 
and they point at something that makes no sense. They read it out of context and they hope that's going to make their life better. It won't. Okay? Fall in love with the Bible. Hopefully you didn't flip and point on any of the meaningful relationships in your life. Okay? I know we can swipe right and all that good stuff nowadays online, but I'm talking about something real and something meaningful. And the Word of God needs to be that. It's where you will find good, godly counsel. In fact, it's not just godly counsel, it is counsel from God. And so I implore you, I beg you, fall in love with the Bible. If you don't know how, come and ask me. We'll walk through it. I'll give you any, any help that I can in regards to you falling in love with the scripture and what the Bible says. Second thing is this. Not only do you need to fall in love with the Bible, you need to fall in love with prayer. Prayer's a big deal. And I grew up praying. I grew up praying everywhere. Anybody, were, were, were your parents like, we're praying everywhere? Parents, like we prayed at every meal. Didn't matter where we were at. If we were at, if we were at someone else's house and they didn't start to pray, my dad would be like, excuse me, do you mind if we pray? This awkward. But we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. How many of you did the creepy kid time prayer? The bedtime prayer? Now I lay me down to sleep. And then Metallica really made it creepy, right? Right? I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I die before I wake. That's a powerful one for a four-year-old, right? We're just going to drop your mortality right in front of you here at four years old. We're going to walk through this. My dad used to change it. He'd say, now I lay me down to sleep with a 57 Chevy parked in the street. If it rolls before I wake, I pray the Lord will put on the brake. That's what my dad used to say. That was a lot less traumatizing than, son, you may die. We, I, I've met people that pray and it's good bread, good meat, good God, let's eat. And that's it. I've met people that pray at dinner time. And how many of you have sweated the person at Thanksgiving that you know if you ask them to pray? Food's going to be cold by the time they're done. Anybody know that person? Just don't invite them. It's okay. You have my permission. I love to pray. I've also learned as I get older that prayer happens so many times throughout my day that it's not always just this moment where I isolate in a room and get down on my hands and my knees and, and bow before the Lord. It's not all the time sitting at a dinner table or a lunch table. It's not, sometimes it's in my truck and I'm driving and I'm, sometimes that's why I drive is because there's no one else in there and I can talk out loud. And when I don't understand, I can say, God, I don't understand. And I need some help with this because I don't know. You say, Pastor Vince, I know I've been told my whole life to pray, but what's the value of prayer? I want you to catch this in the scripture. But the, Jeremiah chapter 33, three says this, call to me and I will answer. And I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Man, I found this scripture and it was so good. In fact, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna memorize this scripture. This is what I'm gonna put in my brain because most of the time I'm praying, it's for an answer that I don't know. Anybody else there with me? Like when you go to God, you don't have the answer. You're like, I better go to God with this, man. I, I don't know what to do. And God tells us in this scripture, if you pray to me, I will answer you. And I will give you the things you don't know. The things you don't know. That's what I want to give you, Vince. But you got to let me pour into you. And, and you get to open up the process. You get to knock on the door of me pouring into you by praying, by praying. We get good counsel. We get good direction. We get the next step in the process. We see another example of this in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And it's a very popular scripture, especially around election time. We hear this scripture a lot, but I want you to hear this as we read through it. It says, then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and he said to him, I have heard your prayer. That tells me Solomon was praying. And it tells me that God is answering just like he said he would. I've heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And then he says this, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. Some of you are like, that doesn't sound like an answer to prayer that I want. You need to understand the history here. 
people of Israel had continually, continually disobeyed God and disobeyed God and disobeyed God. And what God is saying is there's a consequence for that. There is a cause and effect there. If you continually disobey me, there is going to be, there is a consequence. Be sure your sin will find you out. For the wages of sin, is there's a consequence. So when I do this, and then he gives Solomon this, this hope. He said, but if my people who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and they will turn from their wicked way, they'll repent. If, that's what he says, if my people will do this, then. I love if and then in the Bible. If you do this, then I will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive them of their sin and I will heal their land. It's a powerful scripture that God gives us right here when he says, I will hear your prayer and I will give you a process to follow. What's the process? If you will humble yourself, if you will pray and seek God, if you will repent from your sin, then God can not only forgive you, but he can begin to heal the circumstances around you. That's what he promises through what? Through prayer. Through prayer. It all started with prayer, God telling the people if they pray, but the whole verse in, chapter, in verse 12 started when saying, hey, Solomon, I heard your prayer. Solomon said, I don't know what else to do here, but pray. God, I need wisdom, I need guidance, but I'm coming, I'm coming to you with my prayer. So God's word is important. Prayer is important. The second, our third thing is this, the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to be straight with you guys. As I get older, I'm realizing the power of the Holy Spirit in my life more and more. And I want that to sound weird for some of you. You grew up in churches where the Holy Spirit was weird, right? Just be honest, okay? How many of you, you've heard some stories or you've seen some stuff? You're like at a war vet. You're like, Pastor Vince, I'm into a church one time. And I've seen some stuff. <laughs> it's real. But don't let that diminish the reality of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is very real too. And I will tell you that as I get older, what I'm finding out is that my pace is different. You see, my pace is different. Early on, I was trying to impress everybody with my ability to preach or my ability to pastor or my ability to lead or my ability to grow things. And there were a lot of times that I didn't check or I didn't wait for guidance or direction from the Holy Spirit. I just did. And then if it went really well, I gave the Holy Spirit credit for it. And if it didn't go well, I was like, well, maybe the Lord just wasn't leading that way. And so either way, I wasn't to blame. This is just me being honest with you. And now I realize that there is such comfort, I don't know another word for it, in knowing that the weight of following God is not on me figuring out where to go. The weight is on me for just being obedient. That if I will be patient and listen, he has never, ever led me wrong. Never led me wrong, but I have to wait. I, I, I can't be prideful. I can't be the guy that has to make all the decisions. I can't be the, the one shucking and jiving. I can't be the one closing the deal. It's not my deal anymore. I am a slave to the Savior. I am a servant of the cross. And so it's not mine to impress anybody with. I hope this church is impressive to you, not because of me or the worship team or anything that we offer, but because here we teach Jesus Christ, him crucified, buried, and resurrected again. That's the most impressive thing we do. Amen. And it is done and the steps are taken through patience and going, Lord, what do you want us to do today? What do you want us to do today? Lord, where do you want us to go? I've been praying right now for the last two months. Lord, 25 is coming. What, what do the people need? 
What do our people need? What do you need me to preach? What do you need me to speak on? What direction do you want us to go, Lord? How do we encourage the house? How do we build up the house so that people take their next step in faith? How do we, how do we make sure they hear the gospel for the first time and those that have heard the gospel are growing throughout their time? God, how do I do that? What is, what is my next step? So I understand it, but I also know that most of us don't wait long enough. We do not wait long enough for the Holy Spirit to respond to us we just go. And then we go, God, where were you? And he was like, I tried, you were gone. I was sitting in the Holy Spirit and he was gone. You were gone. I had an answer on the way. I don't know if it works like that, but let's see. John chapter 14, verse 26 says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and he will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He, the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things and he will bring to remembrance the things I've already taught you. I love this because this is Jesus talking to the disciples going, fellas, you all have forgot more of what I have taught you in the last three years that we've walked together. You forgot, but it's okay because there's gonna come a day the Holy Spirit is gonna come and in the moment you need it, you're gonna remember a conversation by the fire. In the moment you need it, you're gonna remember a sermon on Sunday morning. You're gonna be at work on a Thursday and all the chaos is gonna be breaking loose and you're gonna be sitting there frustrated and God through the power of the Holy Spirit is gonna recall a moment in your heart and you go, hey, you remember when Vince said that God would never leave you nor forsake you? He said he was gonna supply for you and he was gonna take care of you in these seasons, that he was gonna walk with you and talk with you, that he was gonna know you were in the midst of the storm and he's gonna be with you. That's the Holy Spirit. But if you don't wait on him, if you don't learn to wait and trust, then you miss him. You miss him. Fourth and final one. This is the tough one. See, those first three I figure you'd get, right? Right? Like we're at church, so I'm gonna talk about prayer and I'm gonna talk about the Bible and I'm gonna talk about the Holy Spirit. Here's the fourth one and it's the toughest one. Christ-focused people. You know why that's the hard one? Because most of us don't trust anybody. We don't trust anybody. We're like, man, I don't know, Pastor. You want me to, you want me to pour my guts out to somebody? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I, I, I just don't know that I can do that. I, listen, I understand. I'm a pastor. Several thousand people attend this church over a month's time. We don't even really know the number. But a few years ago, my mom died. My mom died and it was a long battle with liver cancer, liver disease. She got a transplant, came out of the hospital. Everything was good. Went back in the hospital a week later and died a month later. And I missed some Sundays. I'll tell you, I missed the sun. She died on a Saturday. And I missed the Sunday that she died. And her funeral was on a Saturday. It was the next Saturday. And I missed the Sunday of her funeral. And then the next week, I was right back in it, boy, preaching. Got to do what I got to do. And I had good Christ-centered people going, you need to take a break. You need to slow down. Vince, it's okay if you step back. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I gotta, I gotta do, I gotta get it. I gotta get back to doing what I do. I gotta get my mind off this. I gotta get back to doing what I gotta do. You guys remember me saying, I got it. That's what I did. And for several years after that, I'd be fine. Just packed away, Larry, I'd be fine. And then I'd be standing at my kitchen sink. And just the act of reaching over and grabbing a cup to wash, I would just melt, just weep into the dishwater. Missing my mom. Then I'd have to pull off on the side of the road because stinking Tim McGraw writes a song about calling mama. I'd just be wiping snot and tears off my face. 
I never stopped. Now, God has built me, wired me, and I know it now. I have to share. I have to. I know when things get on my heart, I can sense my body tensing up around them, and I have to find somebody. And I'm, I'm quick about it. Like I'm like, I need to talk. There are several counselors that I talk to, friends that I talk to. And some of you I know, you're in the house right now and you're sitting there going, Pastor Vince, I don't know if I have. Most people, most people, when you do the statistics on this, most people have less than what they can count on one hand of people in their life that they truly trust to be able to share anything with. And how heartbreaking that is when we are in the house of God together. It's not the way it's supposed to be. But I can show you why. Justin, can you help me for a second? Come here, buddy. Just stand right over here, Justin. Justin, I want you to put your hands up like I'm gonna give you high fives, okay? So if I come up to Justin and I just... <laughs> what are you doing? Make sure you don't push me back. So just by nature... I didn't tell you to push against me. Nope. You just, by nature, when you felt tension on my side, you pushed back. Yep. And we wonder why we don't trust anybody. You see, we wonder why we, we can't find a safe place to, to pour out the things that hurt our hearts. It's because the moment somebody comes to us, we push back going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't get, don't get you close. When the reality is, sometimes I just, I just need Justin to be right there. And I don't need anything from him. I don't need him to impart insane biblical wisdom to me. Sometimes the counsel that I need is, I don't need you to push against me. I just need you to hold me up. I just need, I just need you to hold me up. And listen, church, if we are not the people that are able to just hold up those who come to us, then what makes us any different than the rest of the world? It's easier to push against, I will tell you. But to be the person that goes, you can lean. And I have been so blessed with people in my life that I can lean on to the point that here at Real Life Church, we've said it's too important to miss. It's too important to miss. I got to a place in my life as a pastor where I was seeing people every day and sometimes anywhere from four to six people a day, couples a day, individuals a day, and I was becoming overwhelmed because I couldn't bear the weight. Not that I don't love people, it was just too much for me. So we immediately began to put into place a plan. We said, we're gonna be there for people. We're gonna be a place where they can lean. So I sat down with Larry and some of you don't know Larry. Larry, if you stand up for me, if you would. Larry Hayden. <laughs> They don't even know what you do and they're clapping for you. It's okay. <laughs> Larry and Glenn Taylor head up what we call our lay counseling, mentoring, coaching. I don't even know if the word matters. What it is is a place where you can, you can lean when you don't know the answer. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to turn. You don't know how to, you don't know how to not lay in bed at night and stare at the ceiling until you just pass out from exhaustion. Some of you, I know that's the place you live right now. If there is so much going on in your mind and you feel like you have no one that you can lean into, you can. You see, because the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 11, Verse 14, where there is no guidance, you will fall. You're going to fall. 
When there's abundance of counselors, there is safety and there is health. And I refuse for us to be a church that doesn't offer safety and health. And so if you're struggling today, you got, I, ben, Pastor Vince, I need, I need that more than I realize. I've got some, some mourning. Man, what you just said is me. I haven't, I haven't really processed through that. I haven't processed through that. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's trauma. There's a season long, long ago that the enemy just does his best. Every time you get still, he twists the knife just a little bit more. Whatever it is, there is wisdom in wise counsel. Whatever it is, there is health and safety and an abundance of counselors. So Larry's going to be out by the connect counter. You good with that, Larry? Larry's going to be out by the connect counter today. If you go, you know what? I, I may need to talk with somebody. Please get good Christ-focused people around you. I want you to bow with me. I'm going to ask you two questions. One I want you to help me out on, and the other one you don't have to make a noise or a move. No one looking around. Here's the first question I'm going to ask you. Pastor Vince, if you're the kind of person that says, you know what? I got it. I've always been told I got it. You don't give your pro you don't tell other people your problems. They got enough to deal with. You keep that on yourself. You just pack it away. It'll eventually go away. And I, I find myself sometimes struggling. My marriage is struggling and I don't know what to do, but I don't know who to talk to or if I even can. My kids are scaring me to death and I don't know what to do. My job, I'm just lost right now. Listen, if that's you this morning, no one looking around, if that's you and you say, Pastor Vince, I struggle reaching out to anybody. I struggle talking with anybody about the stuff that's really going in in my head and in my heart. If that's you, would you just lift your hand and put it right back down? Come on, come on, be honest just for a second. Yeah, you don't have to leave it up, just up and down. It's okay, it's okay. I know that's not easy. The next question, even some of you I know that wanted to raise your hand, but you even couldn't let yourself do that. You're afraid somebody might see it, that you couldn't handle it. That's okay. My next question is maybe even harder. Process is simple. It's not easy. Would you begin to let God change your heart? Would you begin to let God change your heart to where you would talk to somebody? Where you would reach out and just get some place to lean? The Bible says we cast our cares upon Christ because he cares for us. But the Bible says in the book of James that we confess our faults, our hurts, our broken things. We confess those to one another. Why? So that we might be healed. Father, I pray that we would be a place of healing. Pray we'd be a place of broken things being mended through the power of the gospel. God, I pray that people here would take a step today. They would just go talk to Larry talk to one of our people, grab one of the staff, go, hey, I need, I need some help. So that there's healing that takes place. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.